Hello, SBC Church family and everyone that's tuning in to our online worship service. Again, we just want to welcome you and thank you for joining with us in worship this morning. We just invite you to join in as the worship team leads us in singing and worship. And Pastor Noah, our next generation pastor, is going to be bringing the message this morning. And I pray over the next couple of weeks, I will begin to do a look and a study on worship. And so we invite you to join in, to invite others and to share with others. But again, we want to welcome you to our service this morning. We pray for you. We pray blessing upon you. And again, if there's anything we can do, feel free to contact, at, contact us by email at salisburybaptistc at gmail.com. So again, just enjoy yourself as we worship this morning. Let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for this opportunity even to just lift up your name to worship you. And I pray not only will we do it now, but God, we do it every day. God, no matter where we are, but I pray now as we worship team leads us and Pastor Noah brings the message, just use this time, I pray, to just encourage us, build us up in the faith and to encourage one another. So I pray your blessing upon each and every one in the wonderful, powerful, precious name of Jesus. Amen. Give you glory for all you brought me through, and now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. I'm moving forward to follow after you, and now I'm ready for whatever you want. Your presence is an open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is an open door. So come now, Lord, like never
come now, Lord, like never before. Father God, we just invite your presence here today. God, wherever you might be worshiping, God, your presence just be with us today. In your name I pray, amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the
Good morning, Salisbury Baptist Church. So thankful that you're joining us for another online service. Uh, as we come to the word this morning, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your presence and for your purpose, not only being met in us, but being accomplished through us. We pray that your presence and your purpose uh, would be revealed in us and through our lives, that we would be an open channel of your love for not only our own sake, but for the sake of those around us. May we be unified to you, to have union and oneness with you, to be whole, not only in our relationship with you, but also to be unified with one another. May your glory be revealed today and every day as we choose to walk in step with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. One book that I found particularly helpful to me um, in my journey with God has been a book called Present Over Perfect. It was written by a woman named Shauna Nequist. 
who at, in her journey of transitioning from, from living a frantic, disconnected life, learned the secret of soulful, connected living. As we also look at the way that we approach our lives, I find that this quote has been really helpful to me. In her chapter entitled Daughter, she said this, It seems to me that Christians, even more than anyone else, ought to be deeply grounded, living a courageous rhythm of rest, prayer, service, and work. That rhythm is biblical, and it's one that Jesus himself modeled. It seems to me that Christians ought to be free in meaningful and radical ways to bow out of the culture's insistence on proving and competing. Again, like Jesus, it seems to me that Christians ought to care more deeply about their souls than their bank accounts and pant sizes. But I am a Christian, and I am guilty of all of these. Perhaps you relate with me in the struggle uh, of this quote. I mean, all of us, in one way or another, see the model of Jesus and think, I wish I could be as peace-loving as him or as compassionate as him or, you know, walk in that way of just living the way he said to do by not worrying. But i got to be honest, and I'm sure you can be honest with me, that living a life free from worry is not as easy as it sounds. Sure, it's a simple statement, but to actually live it out on a daily basis, like, come on, that's a whole other thing. I don't know about you, but for me, my own struggle with anxiety and depression and, and all of the different struggles that I've been through in my life have, have come up in all kinds of different ways to lead me into a life of frantic panic and stress. And you're like, well, I don't know. I don't really see that in you. You seem like a relatively happy, energetic guy. But the, the problem isn't the fact that I'm, you know, I have a, an approach that says I want to do things well or I want to do things excellently, but the, the problem comes in when I do those things, not from a place of rest and trust, but rather from a place of frantic panicky, fix everything, take control of all that I can kind of life. And I can't do that. Neither can you. None of us can actually survive or let alone thrive in that orphan mindset of saying, I got to make life work by myself. This is all on me. I'm on my own to live in that way is not going to foster a life of thriving joy and freedom. We're tired. We feel like we're working too much, and then we feel like we're working not enough. We're either too much or not enough, whether it's with our family or our church family or with other people. We don't experience peace. We're not experiencing union with God and with other people. Union, that sense of being one, that sense of being unified and united is missing from our lives. And we see that missing link in so many different avenues that we have to actually come to a point where we're willing to face it. And if you're willing to face that with me, come along with me to John chapter 17 as we take a look at the way that Jesus not only talked to his father, but what he talked to his father about. Even though we feel broken and frantic, that the world is against us and that we're against the world, there is an alternative. There is a way out. There is a way to be free from the broken ways and feelings that we're, that we're experiencing. And that thing is union with God. We need to be rooted and grounded in him, to be one with him. But how do we experience deeper union with God in each other? How do we experience oneness? We, do, we feel disconnected between other people and ourselves, but how do we get to this place of sensing that peace? Well, we need to be with him. The bottom line of all this is that union with God is oneness with God. It's being with him in every aspect and dimension of our lives, in our purposes, our plans, our priorities, and also in our presence, in the way that we're present, not only with God, but also with the people that are, that is, that are around us. Um, so come with me to John chapter 17 as we talk about this topic of union with God. Jesus is praying here to the Father. So let's tune in to this conversation that Jesus is having with his Father. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe 
that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So we're going to take a look at this passage um, as we talk about what it looks like to have union with God. Um, as he continues, of course, he says, I've given them the glory that you gave me, uh, that they may be brought to complete unity, that you sent me to love and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you've given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me before the creation of the world. And he continues. But in this context of union, what is Jesus trying to say? Well, to give you a little bit of context for Jesus' prayer to his Father, we have to understand what's going on right now in this snippet of Jesus' life in the Gospel of John. You see, Jesus right now is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right after the Last Supper. He is about to be arrested. This last line is exactly what Jesus says just before the story shifts and the people who are coming to take him away to be crucified appear on the scene. These, these are the last few moments before Jesus' crucifixion begin to take place. And so before these events begin to unfold, Jesus has had a long, long conversation with his disciples in John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. And finally in John 17, he begins this this, this prayer, and we get to see the inside of Jesus' relationship with the Father. I mean, this, this is one of the most profound passages of Scripture because it gives us an insight into what Jesus' intimate prayer life looks like. If you want to know how to pray or you feel you know, disconnected from an idea of, oh man, like I feel like I never know what to pray or I'm in this space and I'm messing up, this is one place to come to see the model that Jesus had for prayer. Um, but we're going to zero in on a few other verses uh, that Jesus said in John 17 to understand the context of union with God. Jesus defined this concept of eternal life that we see throughout the Gospel of John and the Scriptures as being this one centralized thing. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So to have eternal life, so literally the word life here is not just physical, biological life, although sure that might be involved. But eternal life is specifically referring to that spiritual and physical life that begins today and goes on to forever. The sense of life that we're getting here is not just any kind of life. It is the very life breath of God himself. But it has physical expression and spiritual expression. It is in the present and it is in the future. And so to have life, eternal life, to truly experience the life breath of God himself in our lives is that we know God, the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. So this is Jesus' definition of what eternal life is. And in, in effect, it refers to the life of God in a person expressing itself in an unfolding process of learning and transforming and changing and repenting. And it's really a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love this because it gives clarity to so much of what Jesus said in the Gospels. And that word knowing is not just knowing by, by learning a concept. It is literally the word know as you would see in maybe an apprenticeship program at NBCC. It is knowing, but especially by personal experience. And so that brings that definition of not only eternal life, but also just knowing God as being an ongoing, all-encompassing experience of the life breath of God. And so the next thing that helps us give us some context for the rest of what Jesus is going to say here in John 17 is this, all I have is yours and all you have is mine. 
and glory has come to me through them. And that then that he's talking about is the disciples as he's praying through this. But I wanted you to zero in on what he says here. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. Knowing God is 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 important to eternal life. It is eternal life. But there's also this other component on our side, right? Jesus has been sent. He's done all the hard work. He's done all the heavy lifting. But there's also on our own end, this place of surrender. Jesus set the example of surrender as being totally belonging to God and receiving belonging from God. Everything that we have ought to be his. And everything that he has, he is delighted to give to us. It is complete surrender. It is belonging. Us to him, and ultimately him to us. And so I want wanted to just make that clear because it, it provides a lot of important context for what Jesus is going to clear up here in a few minutes, which is this. In John 17, verses 22 to 23, the, the, the message about union is clarified. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Um, what does that mean when Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me? Um, I have never heard that much, uh, at least, talked about in any way that has been substantial. I don't know about you. Maybe your experience has been different. But for me, most of what we learn about at church is about redemption, about the cross, about us being you know, worthless, helpless sinners in need of a Savior. And when we turn to that Savior, we're redeemed, we're made new, we're given new life, and that's awesome. But never do I hear that Jesus has given us the glory that the Father gave him, and I certainly don't hear it explained. So what is it that he's saying? So the word glory there is the word doxa. It's literally the word that we use in the entire New Testament for glory in any context. It's doxa. It means to, to proclaim that something is good and valuable and worthy. Um, it comes from the other Greek word dokeo, which literally means to exercise personal opinion, which determines value. In other words, it means to convey worth. So to show doxa or to give glory it means to declare that something is valuable. It is essentially a verdict, a label that someone is either valuable or not. That's what the, the basic dokeo means. And when this doxa word comes in, the glory word, um, it means that God gave glory. He pronounced value on Jesus, and Jesus then in turn has given us that glory that he was given. So you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? When did it happen? I don't understand. How does that play out. Well, the glory that Jesus received, the, the verdict of value that Jesus received, if you recall, was when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. He comes up to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is freaking out. He's like, whoa, what are you doing here? I don't need to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. But then Jesus says, this is to uh, to to, uh, to accomplish fullness of righteousness, right? It's to do the thing that needs to be done uh, for now. And John's like, okay, cool. So he baptizes Jesus, and then Jesus comes up, and if you remember the story, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove, and then a voice came from heaven saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Now, this is really important for the whole story of the scriptures because it is God's affirmation, not only Jesus as as the man, God, person, the relationship there, but also for the launching of Jesus into his earthly ministry. There is a one part of like, obviously, hey, this is, this is my son. I proclaim that this person is mine and he is from me. So pay attention. But there's also the side that God is giving Jesus glory. He is saying this person is valuable to me and has a deep, intimate relationship with me. He proclaims and place the, places the label on Jesus that he is God's son and therefore valuable. But what does it mean exactly that Jesus gave us the glory that the Father had given him? If you notice in the language, he says first, this is my son. Meaning he bestows on him the name son, sonship. But we see this theme in other places in scripture, specifically in Romans chapter 8. 
verses 14 to 17. So we're going to turn uh, there really quick. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, for children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. It says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. In in essence, the, the Holy Spirit given to us when we accept Jesus has given us the Spirit. Uh, sonship has given us relationship with God, not merely as servants or slaves, but as sons and daughters, as children of God. And that's important when we hear what Jesus is saying about glory, because when he says that, he's saying Jesus has given us the intrinsic worth which the Father had given him. Through redemption and Jesus' own choosing, we are given value as the prodigal son was given Value. If you remember in the story, the prodigal son came to back to the father in humility and in repentance. And in return, the father dressed him in a robe and put a ring on his finger and killed the fattened calf and had a feast. Because he no longer regarded him as his lost son and also was now no longer worthy to be called the son and also a slave. Rather, he didn't look at him that way. He looked at him rather as the son who is now returned to me. And he placed value on him by dressing him as a son and giving him the right and privilege of celebration. And so the Father has given us the same glory through Jesus by pronouncing to us that we are his sons and daughters. So through this, adoption has made it possible that we have union with God. This this oneness, this relationship that is unbroken and established. It is literally belovedness and belonging from the Father by the Holy Spirit through Jesus. In other words, because of God's amazing love expressed to us in Jesus, you belong with with the Father and you are adored by him. Because of the amazing love and forgiveness of God in Jesus, you not only belong, but you are beloved in his sight. It's not only that you stand justified, but also that you stand as a child through Jesus. Now, this ought to help us to understand a little bit of what it means to have union, not only with God as our father, to come into the relationship of a family member, which is crazy to even think about, but also the fact that There are other people, of course, who also have that established union with God through faith in Jesus. There are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Language isn't just because we want to pretend that we're close to each other, even though we kind of have this annoyance or that irritation. It literally means that God has not only made us part of his family, but also made every other person a part of this new family as well that believes in Jesus. So this ought to teach us what it looks like to have unity between us as well. Uh, We use the example of family, right? No matter what happens around you or between you, we still treat each other like family. I've seen this a lot in churches. I've been to quite a few churches in my life um, and in all kinds of different denominations. Um, I've seen all kinds of people have all kinds of divisions about things and yet always stick close to their family members. So even if there might be some sort of vengeful grudge against, you know, Doris, the music director, because that vengeful grudge is there, There's a division there. But even if that is there, Roger, who may have betrayed me years before, is still my uncle and I'm going to forgive him. But we should be treating everyone as we would our blood relative, if not better, because of the relationship that that person has to the Father, even as we do. We, along with our brothers and sisters in Christ, are given the right and privilege of sons and daughters and ought to treat one another with the same honor with which God has treated us. So we treat each other like family. And the more aware of God's verdict we are, the more aware of that label of love and belonging and belovedness that we are aware of, the better that we exemplify his love to other people. And the more natural it is and will be to live in the realities of his word 
and all eternal life, in everyday details of life, and namely in meaningful freedom and joy, like Shauna said earlier. It means to live in that place of not just childlike faith, but the faith of a child, the faith that belongs to one who is called son or daughter in the kingdom of God. And this is no better demonstrated than in our suffering. I don't know how many about, I don't know about you guys, but for me, um, I'm kind of back and forth about how I feel about everything going on here with coronavirus and COVID-19. Quite frankly, I'm just tired of it and I want it all to be over right now. And sometimes I'm like, I'm kind of glad I don't have to see anybody right now. I'm a, I'm a mess. But whatever that looks like, that suffering that I'm experiencing and that we're all experiencing will put our faith, our childlike faith, to the test. It'll show not only what we think about ourselves and the situation, but what we think about God and how we see God showing up in our lives despite the suffering and in the suffering. So while we're going through this time, are you experiencing more of his presence or are you becoming more aware of your loneliness? Do you feel more distant or do you feel closer to God as a result of everything that's taking place? My hope and my prayer for you is that you do experience more closeness with God, but I admit as long, along with you that I don't always feel as close to God as I ought to, as his, as his word tells me that I should. Union is God being with us and us being with God in every way possible. That's what union is and what it looks like. And so even though we might be isolated from our friends and our families, we are not isolated from God. And we ought to experience even deeper closeness and intimacy with him because to have union means to be with and him to be with us. So notice again in Romans chapter 8, it does not say uh, that we've been given a spirit of sonship so that we can you know, hide in a corner terrified of our abusive father. It doesn't say that. It says the spirit that you received makes you a son of God. Those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. But you notice the contrast. To have a father means to be free from fear. And that fear, as the Bible talks about in other places, has to do with punishment. It has to do with our, our, our plans. It has to do with our circumstances and our pains. But why does he say, why does it say that? Why does it communicate that fear is dispelled when we have the presence of our father with us? When you're parenting, you are with your child. Generally speaking, leaving your child alone in a Walmart is pretty bad parenting. It's unresponsible or irresponsible. And so we sometimes feel like we're, that God has abandoned us. Sometimes we ask the question. We sometimes we get mad at God, like, hey, why didn't you do anything? But sometimes you feel like that kid lost in Walmart being like, mom, where are you? You know, like just, just not sure what's going on. We're just lost and out of place. The worst thing a parent could do to a child is to abandon them, is to leave them. And anxiety ensues. If you look at every different case study that takes place from, from children who are abandoned by their parents or by a parent, you see a long-running struggle with anxiety. Anxiety has to do with fear regarding the future, and stress that ensues as a result, but it happens because there's no sense of stability. Because of a lack of security, there's no reason to think that the future will be any better. And so security only comes with the presence of that parent. The students or hurt people that struggle less with anxiety are those parents who have this stable, affectionate, and authoritative relationship with their children. Because it communicates to them that, no, I set the boundaries, but I'm also going to protect you, and I'm going to provide for you as long as I possibly can. And then some. And that child will face life with more confidence than one who is abandoned. And there's no shame that's, re that's regarded with a child who's been has had a loving parent. But sometimes shame comes in, even today, my kids who have been abandoned by their parents. In the culture that Paul and Jesus are talking that are talking in right now, to be fatherless was to be have was to have public shame. It was to have uh, to have embarrassment as a result of not having a father. It was to be nameless and it was to be alone. People were not quite very loving toward orphans. They were nameless, but they were also isolated. So they were forced to do things on their own or figure life out by themselves. But God being with us, having union with us as a father to a child through Christ, means that we have the ability to be free from fear. 
That doesn't mean that I don't always wake up with fear in my life, but that when the fear comes, I'm able to face it with more confidence because of the relationship I have with God. Um, this is shown really clearly, and specifically in Psalm 23. So we're going to look at this briefly, and we're going to just jump right out of it because, um, because we don't want to spend too much time thinking about it. Thinking too much about this actually causes us to feel even more distant from God. It's not something that we think about. It's not something that we just talk about. It's something that we live in, that we dwell in, to the point where we're not always even aware that we're living in it at all. It becomes that natural. As Psalm 23 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, if you know me for any long period of time, you'll know that at nighttime, I struggle with paranoia and anxiety. I have a machete in my bedroom, not because I bought one, but because my friend Jeff gave it to me as a present, um, which was an odd gift, I know, but hey, machetes are cool. Anyway, he put my name on it and then gave it to me as a gift for being a groomsman of his. And that's kind of cool because it's nice to have a sharp weapon by your bedside at different times, especially when you live in a rough neighborhood, as I have in different times in my life. However, I now live in Second North River, so I don't know if a machete is really necessary. That said, I still keep it right there. Not because I'm afraid that God's not going to take care of me, but every once in a while, this overwhelming sense of anxiety comes on me, and I'm like, oh man, like, God, like, is there somebody here? Like, am I going to have to check? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm freaking out. Now, that is growing, increasingly rather, becoming more and more alleviated as I walk into this kind of relationship of union with God. And your fears and anxieties, whatever they may look like, should be eventually more and more naturally dissipated as a result of your relationship with God. If I had been going through the same kinds of fears and habits and and failures as I did when I first became a Christian, that's a problem. We're supposed to be growing in our relationship with God and allowing every part of our own selves to be consumed by his presence. So if we don't see that, that's a problem. But as we do see more and more freedom from fear, we can be sure that God's presence is at work. In the same way that having my dad as a child around made me feel less anxiety, in, this, in that way, having our father have this relationship of withness in our lives should give us the same sense of security and stability, even when everything on the outside is making us feel afraid. Because when I was a kid, I did not struggle with paranoia because my dad was big and he was scary. Like, just looking at him made you want to just turn around and run away. And that's coming from the sun. Imagine somebody breaking into his home. It wasn't pretty. But here's the thing. The bottom line is having my dad around made me feel a lot more at peace because I knew that my dad was going to take care of our family whatever it costs. But when we have that same relationship to the Father, we experience less fear. So even though we walk through the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death itself, we need not fear any evil. Why? For you are with me. As orphans or having an orphan mindset, it drives us to this place of having to make things for ourselves, to figure life out on our own. Um, there's this movie that I watched recently. It's on Netflix. I don't know if you'd like it. Maybe you would. I don't know. Anyway, it's called The Willoughby's. It's about the, the story of four children who are abused by their parents. And because of the abuse that they experienced by their parents, they, they wanted to do what they could to become free from them by sending them away somewhere so that they could be dealt with, so that they could literally live as orphans and make life for themselves. And without spoiling too much about the movie, what I will tell you is that the orphan thing didn't work out super great, and all they did was go hungry. The thing is, we cannot survive, let alone thrive, by thinking that the things that God can do for us as we walk in union with him can be done by ourselves. It's impossible to survive and thrive as orphans. We sometimes feel that we have to figure things out by ourselves because it's easier than having to put faith in God. Or maybe it's more simple. But God is calling us to, to allow our childish needs to be placed in his hands and allowing him to take care of things as he gives us the strength to be responsible for that which has been placed in our hands. I hope that COVID-19 has showed us what, uh, what foolishness or what ineffectiveness 
we have brought to the table in terms of our relationship with God. I don't know about you, but COVID-19 has caused me to face myself just as much as it's caused me to face the issue. It's caused me to face God in light of all that I am and all that I'm not. I've been caused to take a look at the way that I've been living as an orphan and allow God to come in and show me what his fatherly love will come and do in my heart through his love. So as you face that, as you face this mindset that says, i got to figure life out by myself, I'm on my own, if you begin to live the way that God tells you to live, by trusting in him, even just for a few days, it will change everything. As we place ourselves before God for a deeper relationship with him, we begin to be filled with his love. And that love flows out from us to everyone else we meet. It is shared with others. We become a channel of his love by being poured into and allowing that love to be poured out of us. We become a vessel. God's love flowing in and through us to the benefit of others. As the, the psalmist continues, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, but especially focus on my cup overflows. And then he says, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice he doesn't say, your goodness and love will be in front of me all the days of my life. He says, your goodness of love and love will follow me all the days of my life. As you live in this relationship, you'll begin to look back and see all the lives that have been changed as a result of your choice to surrender to God and live in union with him as his child. As scary as walking into the unknown with God may be, the result and the fruit of those decisions are way, way better. To look back and see his goodness and love, not only in your life, but through your life, it makes all the pain and suffering that comes along the way completely worth it. Trust me. Union with God is witness in God. To have witness in God, which I know is not actually a word, but witness in God is to be with God in purpose and in presence. It is to be with him in our priorities. It is to be with him in our plans, it is to be with him in the things that we believe God has placed before us, in those purposes, in every way, in every aspect of our will and decision making, and even in our thoughts and emotions, we ought to be one with God, and also to be one with God in presence, to be present with him throughout not only the morning that we have with him or that hour of the day where we set apart to read the Bible or to pray, but to really be with him and to have this sense of presence and continual communion with God throughout our day, throughout the hard times and the good times, to be celebrating, to be, to be weeping, to be giving thanks, and everything to be giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus as we live and do everything for him. So witness in God is being one with him in purpose and in presence, to be seeking his presence with all our hearts, and to be giving our purposes and desires over to him. Just as Jesus said, all I have is yours, and all you have is mine. As Jesus finishes up his earlier conversation with the disciples, he told them a lot of things. Some of them were really, really good things. Some of them went very well aligned with everything that he prayed in John chapter 17. And other things talked about being persecuted as a result of their testimony about Jesus. The thing that hurt them the most was that they knew that Jesus would be going away and wouldn't be coming back for some time. But when he told them all the things, good and bad, he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. No matter what is going on around us, no matter what is going on in us, Jesus has told us the things that he has told us, whether they're good or difficult to hear, that we may have peace. And that peace comes as a result of being in him. Not merely, not merely being a believer in him, but being in him. To allow everything under the jurisdiction of our lives and responsibilities to be submitted to him. And to be with him, not only in those things, but also in our details. So eternal life is worked out in union with God. And the closer you are to God, the more life you have. The more God that you have, the more life that you have, the more fruit that you have, the more people, the more unity, the more like Jesus you have in your life. 
And not only that, we also want more of God in our life that we may help others to know him, to see him, to live in union with him, even as we live in free and joyous freedom in union. He works that out in us as he pours himself and his love into our lives. If you want more union, you must put yourself before God. Meaning you have to come to that space every day of of taking the time you need to spend time with him. And you need to lay down your own will and desires and plans and priorities before him. That he may take both those things and yourself into a deeper relationship with him. As we come to close this morning, we're reminded that to be unified with God is to have completeness, to truly be whole. The more close we are to Jesus, the more we realize just how deeply loved we are and how much we belong to him. So my challenge to you today is to surrender and worship and pray. Do everything you can and everything in your power to invite more of his presence and union into your life as you build on him. It looks like anything from doing the dishes while praying or talking to God or rejoicing or giving thanks or in those special times at church or those special times now in your living room, whatever that looks like for you, it's not only attainable, it is your right and privilege as his child to receive more of his love and to live more deeply in his union, resulting in love flowing out of you to the lives of those around you and in your own peace. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. We're so thankful that you are with us. And as we close today, remember these things and pray. Let's close together and talk to God. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you do not leave us as orphans. You have come to us through Jesus. That you have given us your spirit, the spirit of sonship, that we may cry out to you and say, Father, Father, come help Be with me. We know that your presence is with us and that your purpose will win out in the end. We trust that you are working all things to the good of those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth, in us and through us, as it is in heaven. Give us today everything we need. Provide for us in every way that we need to help us to receive more of your life and presence. In Jesus' name, amen.